Whales, or the group more formally known as cetaceans, are a really weird group. Their adaptations and body plans are excessively strange, and they're not really a group that do small. But trust me, you do not know the half of it. Cetaceans are a clade within mammalia who are and include all completely marine mammals including all whales, dolphins and orcas. So this isn't just a hugely diverse group, it's also a completely global one and they achieve this in an astoundingly quick amount of time. Within cetaceans are two main orders. The Mystocetae or baleen whales which get bloody huge and the Odontocetae or toothed whales which are famous for their intelligence and use of echolocation. Now, despite how they look from the outside, their skeletons show many classic characteristics of mammals, including the single temporal fenestra shared by all synapsids, which I speak more about here. But obviously they changed a lot of things up as well. First up is the limbs. Cetaceans shorten their arms excessively to the point where barely any of their flipper is arm and it's almost all hand, having highly flexible and powerful fingers. The hind limbs are, well, gone. In fact, cetaceans don't even have a pelvis anymore and their entire back half is all tail. A feature that is almost always seen in terrestrial vertebrates that return back to the sea is the diffusing of the skeleton. You'll often see the pelvis detach and diffuse from the spine and in the case of cetaceans, the ribs almost fully detach from the spine. The reason for this detachment in marine vertebrates is that there is less gravity to fight against but a hell of a lot more pressure. The diffusion of these body parts and a more floaty skeleton means that their bodies can handle the much higher pressures that their bodies are subjected to. But then we have those massive heads. These aren't really sat on top of much neck, but the skulls themselves have some of the most derived traits in mammalia. The brain case has expanded massively, baleen whales lost their teeth and replaced them with filters, huge holes formed to support large musculature, and their nostrils move to the top of the head, which many now call the blowhole. Now cetaceans are some of the weirdest marine animals ever and have also given us the largest animals to ever exist in this planet's history. But to see how they actually started off only seems even weirder. So let's take a look at their journey. I'm also gonna be throwing in a few terms and events from the Paleogene period. So if you haven't already watched that video, I'll leave it here. During the first epoch of the Paleogene, known as the Paleocene, one particular group of mammals were grown to prominence and diversity to an extreme degree. These were the Artiodactyls, also known as the even-toed ungulates. And though it includes a lot of extinct groups like giraffes, pigs, deers and camels, the amount of extinct groups that once roamed around is staggering. To the point that if you saw a mammal larger than a ferret at this point in time, there's a high likelihood that it was an artiodactyl, even if it was a predator. But the cetacean story begins in the Indian subcontinent around 50 million years ago with Indohyus. Indohyus was a small artiodactyl around the size of a raccoon who lived a humble, omnivorous lifestyle. And nothing seemed all that special about this guy from the outside, but it was already shown some semi-aquatic adaptations namely denser limb bones to help combat buoyancy. Now it's thought that it had these adaptations for the same reason that African Chevetane have theirs, which is to use the predator avoidance strategy of running and hiding underneath the surface of a nearby body of water until the predator moves on. But in the end, Indohyus was actually found to be very closely related, but not quite a cetacean. What was found to be the earliest direct ancestor of whales was a group known as the Pachycetids. These guys existed in today's Pakistan around the same time as Indohyus, living in arid floodplain environments with stream systems in which they possibly waded through and waited underwater to ambush small prey items. Now they didn't really show many skeletal adaptations that would have made them hugely competent swimmers, but they did have eyes more positioned near the top of the head like many crocodilians, as well as having denser bones and also the tools that would later evolve to give cetaceans their specialised hearing for underwater. Now if we jump forward a million years or so in the same area, we come across a critter known as Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus shows very suddenly how quick further adaptations were being made, with isotope analysis showing that they fed in a mixture of saltwater and freshwater environments, and had limbs more adapted for true swimming as well as possessing a pad of fat within the lower jaw. 
This fat pad is seen in modern cetaceans and is actually how they hear. Now we humans can hear underwater, but because sound acts so differently down there, we would hear sounds as if they were right next to us and all around us. Cetaceans, on the other hand, pick up vibrations through their lower jaw, which reverberates through this fat pad to the middle ear, meaning they can also pick up the direction of sound underwater. Now it's thought that Amulus eaters had similar levels of aquatic nests as otters, but many have argued that these guys didn't even come to land at all. Moving along the whale timeline, we then come to the Remington Ascetids. This group was spread across Pakistan and India right up until 43 million years ago, and looked vastly closer to mammals' best impression of a crocodile. Now this group was actually shown the point in which cetaceans were completely abandoning any freshwater environments, instead now only inhabiting coastal, shallow marine environments. The bodies were now longer with shorter limbs and the nostrils were now positioned at the top of the snout meaning that those sniffers had begun their journey to becoming blowholes. Then a few more million years later we see that this group was now starting to branch out into other continents. Protocetids were a group found across Asia, Africa and North America that showed even more aquatic adaptations than the Remington Ascetids. With better adapted eyes and limbs that whilst cumbersome on land were a lot wider for better swimming but these guys still weren't quite all the way. The ears still lack special sinuses that modern cetaceans use to really perfect that hearing, and one particular protocetid named Myocetus was actually found showing that it was pregnant. Now what's important here is that the fetus, which appears close to being born, was positioned head first. Animals that give live birth underwater actually birth their offspring tail first rather than head first, which reduces the baby's risk of drowning. So by the looks of it, this particular protocetid would still come onto land to give birth. After this, we get to the late Eocene around 41 to 33 million years ago, and now we start to see a group that is not only very recognizably whaley, but also has some pretty famous names. This particular group of toothed whales were aquatic obligates, fully marine, and spread worldwide, and are known as the Basilosaurids. Named after the main man, Basilosaurus, findings of this guy were originally attributed to some sort of marine reptile, hence the confusing name, Basilosaurus. These guys range vastly in size, from 4 to 20 metres, or 13 to 66 feet long, and are very recognisable by their long heads, short necks, heterodontic dentition, or two types of teeth, as well as a very long body with hind legs that well, it just might as well not be there. Now the recognisability is whales also extended to their impressive size. Basilosaurus itself was a pretty big boy, reaching sizes of up to 60 feet, and a recent discovery this year has given us Perucetus, potentially the biggest animal in Earth's history, which is one of the stories I touch on here. Again, these guys do not do small. Then it's within the last 30 million years that cetaceans split into the two main groups that we know today. Toothed whales, which include all dolphins, porpoises, orcas and sperm whales, diverged and developed very recognisable body plans, with famous names like Leviathan, which I will be talking about in the new year. They also develop melons on their heads. No, really. The melon organ genuine name, is a large hump of specialised sensitive fat on the front of their head that they use for their excellent echolocation, something that they actually now rely on more than sight. Now on the other side of that convergence we have the baleen whales which has given us the biggest animal alive today, the blue whale. These guys decided teeth were too mainstream and dropped them in place of, well, baleen. Essentially a keratinous comb is present in the mouth through which only water can pass. The reason for this is that this group elected to filter feed, taking massive gulps of water before pushing the water back out through the baleen, which then nets any large planktonic species such as krill. But the heads of baleen whales also grew to accommodate this, growing absolutely huge relative to the body, and with the lower jaw especially growing wide and deep, letting them take in as big a mouthful as possible. And so whales serve as an example of just how drastically life can change on our planet in an insanely short amount of time. Going from this to this. Now there is a lot more that I could touch on with the evolution of cetaceans. So if you feel that there's anything that I've glazed over or would like me to go into in more detail, be sure to let me know down below. 
and I will catch you guys next time.